what about drug resistance, um, Ian? Do, are we seeing it? Do, is it? You know, you and I used to give lectures all the time about drug resistance, and now nobody asks me to give a lecture about drug <laughs> resistance. <laughs> it's certainly a lot less common than it used to be. Yeah. In Philadelphia, in our needle exchange program, 90% of people who are injecting heroin every day have undetectable viral wow. loads. Wow. Um, so I don't think that that's much different than most everybody's practice. We're seeing virologic suppression rates of 90% uh, uh, in most clinic uh, cohorts. So we, we don't see resistance because the drugs work very well and they have a higher genetic barrier to resistance. I still do resistance testing in people who are coming into care. Um, I don't generally, uh, there is a debate. Uh, and most likely you're gonna see uh, resistance to the NNRTI class. And even though I don't typically start a patient on an NNRTI based regimen, almost never uh, these days, I still wanna know it's, if it's there. In a handful of percent, maybe you're gonna see a baseline M184V. I, I think it's helpful to know this because if people fail again, uh, I'd, I'd like to I, I'd like to know um, what was there previously, um, and I'll still occasionally order a resistance test. I do have a handful of people who who do struggle taking their medications and develop resistance, um, but people on a boosted protease inhibitor don't generally get a PI resistance. People on a next generation integrase inhibitor generally do not get integrase associated mutations. Um, so we're not seeing failure, I think, as much because these drugs do have a higher barrier to resistance. But what about, do, do, do you have patients that, where you see that, that have multi-drug resistance that you have to think about treating them? How I, often I, do you I definitely that? do. I have people who started on single nucleoside therapy right, yeah, way back yeah. when and uh, a, a number of years ago when uh, uh, darunavir and raltegravir were first available, I was able to get people on a regimen that for the first time was able to suppress virus replication. But they have, uh, they have um, protease resistance, they have nuke resistance, they have NNRTI resistance. I've got people who, got, who started on raltegravir that have integrase resistance. So I do have some people uh, who I am wondering when I will use some of the next generation drugs that we now have available to us um, and how to time that uh, in a way that's most likely to be successful with, with a long-term strategy in mind. So, we do, Can could, you talk about perinatal? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think that, to, I mean, same thing. We have patients who they were the first kids to ever see any of these drugs, single agent, and then, you know, tell the story of the treatment of HIV. And so they harbor tons of resistance, right? But they will, for the first time, five years ago, whatever, be able to be suppressed. But you've got to know, because as life changes, they can potentially become non-adherent. I need to know what's in my armamentarium. Sure. I will say that, you know, with the uh, the l, -L tegravir based regimens, we did see some accumulation of integrase mm -hmm. um, mutations yes, that absolutely. actually can impact cabotegravir, et cetera. And so, yeah. I, you know, that's one place I, I definitely think it's worth if you see failure on those earlier regimens. The other place where I do do quite a bit of resistance testing, we have a, a fair number of patients who immigrate from Africa and the Caribbean, et cetera, where there are other different regimens are being used. And oh, there is a... Nobody's checking for resistance there. So, you know, understanding what's coming in, there's a lot of transmitter resistance as well. It's a lot of failure, but no viral load testing in a lot of places. So knowing um, for those would be important. Yeah, I think we're, we're fortunate that we, we don't have very many people that are viremic and have uh, lots of resistance. Um, uh, a lot of those really complicated people have been suppressed. I worry I have a few that are kind of like, Boy, if they ever rebound, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and occasionally, we we um, you know we do see um, uh, we, we do have to think about someone who has very limited treatment options. There's there's a a, a newer drug, ibilizumab. Colleen, can you say something about ibilizumab? Yeah. So ibilizumab is a monoclonal antibody that binds the CD4 receptor and prevents. Um, 
the virus from being able to bind the co-receptor when the antibody is bound to the CD4. It can't bind the CCR5 uh, co-receptor. Um, it is an infusion, um, mm -hmm. and it is approved for heavily treatment experienced people with resistance and really no other options, um, mm -hmm. and does uh, appear to be effective uh, in treating those folks. I will say in our very large clinic, um, 6,000 active patients, we really only have a handful, less than five, that are even candidates um, for ibilizumab, and so we have not a lot of experience with the medication, right. but we are using it in very, very select yeah, cases. We have, we have two people, and, mm -hmm. and certainly it's the goal, of course, is to give them other active components. It's not going to work very well as a single no. drug, but occasionally we do have to, to do that. Yeah, often in combination with multiple, multiple other medications. Multiple other Absolutely. Uh, medications.